Notre Dame is going to be probably one of the most famous cathedrals that we look at, especially from an American perspective. It's the one that we've all heard of, and it's because, of course, it's the central cathedral in the city of Paris. Notre Dame, of course, basically is the equivalent of saying St. Mary's. There are lots of Notre Dames in France, so if you walk into any town in France, you're likely to find a cathedral or a church named Notre Dame. But leaving that all aside, let's start looking at this important structure. And of course, it plays a major role in a lot of literature, in movies, in all sorts of things. If you remember from, I believe it was the movie Armageddon, you see a scene where Paris is being destroyed by an asteroid, but you're seeing it from Notre Dame. So it has become a major landmark. Now, Louis VI will move his official residence to Paris in 1130. He makes this the leading city of France. And ultimately, as France grows in power, really much of Northern Europe. The Gothic Cathedral was begun by the Archbishop of Paris, and it's massive for its time. It's 108 feet high, 400 feet long. And when we look at the church itself, that means that roughly when we're looking inside to the roof line, we're somewhere around 60 meters, which would put it, well, very, very high, a uh, little bit, yeah, right, right in that, uh, right in that, sorry, 45 meters. So it's going to be massive. The roof inside is 100 plus feet above you or the ceiling inside, and it's big enough for a football field. So it's an incredible cathedral. And remember, the size of these cathedrals is to show how pious that city, village, or town is. It's this religious sort of arms race. So we're going to have these large cathedrals being built on a regular basis. This is not going to be the largest. You would think in Paris it would be, but in fact, it won't. Now, in 1182, we see what we believe is the first introduction of flying buttresses. We say likely to be the first site because Chartres Cathedral and a couple of other sites are building at the time. They may have used them. They may have designed them ahead of Notre Dame. It's kind of hard to say. It could also be parallel development. But this is where I need to bring up the pen so that I can show you the importance of what we're dealing with. Now, this is a flying buttress. And it runs along here. Now, the typical buttress would have a wall in here, so it wouldn't have this arch opening. Everything under here would typically be filled in. The reason is it's taking the weight from the roof and the ceiling and the wall and transferring it out to the pier that is out here. Obviously, this one for the next buttress, but you get the idea. Uh, this pier, or this pier in this case, uh, these piers exist at the end of the buttresses, and they transfer that weight from the buttress down into the ground, because of course we need to always take weight to the ground. That's the basis of architecture. So by using a flying buttress, you do a couple of things. First of all, it's much lighter. Secondly, it's more efficient, so it uses less stone. And third, and probably most importantly for a Gothic cathedral, with this opening in the middle, that means light can pass through it. If I had a series of walls here, they would block out much of the light. If you have walls of glass, like we did do at Notre Dame, as you see here, you want that light coming in. It's another symbol of God's presence to the people at the time. When we look at the facade, you'll notice that it actually seems very interestingly proportioned and sort of intentional. So from here down, from that level to here, these are roughly equal. It's split into thirds. And across, it's roughly equal again to the bell tower, between the bell tower, and again to the edge of the facade. So we have really a giant tic-tac-toe board. And this is, as I said, intentional. When they're doing this, they're trying to use proportions that are going to be attractive to the people looking at it. So they're going to use sometimes quarters, sometimes thirds. Oftentimes it will be related to their understanding of, say, the human form. 
Sometimes those proportions will be sacred. And so you'll see things that are, say, 72 feet high, reflecting the idea of revelation, or 144, or 40. And these are sacred numbers uh, that we've seen in the past. So this is all proportional. You'll notice as we're moving ahead in the Gothic, we have the use of the false arcade here. So what this is, is it looks like a covered walkway. It in fact isn't, but it gives depth to that part of the building. We have the use of the rose window. We have that arcade moving across the front, even though you can see the roof of the nave of the church behind it. We also have an increased use of sculpture, not just across the facade, but within the deep portals around the door as well. And just a reminder, many of these sculptures have been redone in the 19th century after they were damaged during the French Revolution. So when you look at cathedrals like this, things like the spire and the sculptures can be much, much later. We'll get into some of that in a little bit. When we move inside, you'll notice it's massive. And again, let me remind you of the context. We're in the 12th century, 13th century. People are living in homes that are dark. They're sooty because they have indoor fires without chimneys and such. They're short, typically, you know, six foot ceilings. If anything, maybe there's a door and maybe one window, maybe a couple of windows, but it's going to be dark. It's going to be small. It's going to be compact. And now you walk into this space and it's massive. And so from the peasant's perspective or the working class perspective, whoever you want to look at, they're going to look at this as a miracle on earth. We have that incredible ceiling that's being held up 100 feet or so above our heads. We have all of this light coming in, which is something brand new to us. And that light, when it's, say, for example, early in the morning and the light shining directly in one of those sides, it will give the impression that the roof or the ceiling is actually floating above you because it's a little bit lighter beneath it and then darker as you move up. So the scale, the immensity, the light, this is all creating this sense of miracle. And from a spiritual perspective, the verticality, by narrowing that nave, pulls your eye up, which makes you think of things that are spiritual or heavenly, which is, of course, why you're in the church in the first place. And you'll notice there's a lot of verticality here. We have the columns, of course, leading into these engaged columns that lead into the rib vaults on the ceiling. Those rib vaults are six-part rib vaults. So instead of the typical four, they've added one in the middle and one in between each bay, thus creating a six-part. Eventually, we'll see them go back to a more simple four-part because you don't need the six, but we're going to see the importance of this shortly. This rib vault design may be why Notre Dame is standing today. When we look at an elevation, so this is where I've cut the cathedral in half or cut through the nave, what you see is a three-part elevation. Originally, it was supposed to be four. Uh, we see the Claire story, so the windows that are up high. We see an, excuse me, we see a gallery, so a second level where you can look down on the floor, and we see the aisle, which is the area between these columns and the wall. So this is basically expansion space. For example, when you have Christmas or Easter, major holidays. Now, I said this was supposed to be a four-part elevation. They believe that this was uh, originally conceived that way, like Léon, but eventually changed into a three-part elevation, possibly for simplicity, possibly for structural reasons. It's possible that they just didn't think that they could do that, given the materials, given the stone that they have, because each of these cathedrals is built with relatively local limestone, which means it's going to have different strengths. So sometimes you might not be able to build the same height that you would elsewhere, simply because the stone won't take it. Now, this cathedral will go ahead and anticipate what we will see in the High Gothic. For example, we see the use of rib vaults. We see the three-part elevation with the Claire story, the gallery, and the arcade. We see massive windows all over the place. And you can see how bright this is during the day. 
And we see the use of the flying buttress, a key element that we tend to see in Gothic cathedrals. It sets this out as sort of a prime example of Gothic cathedrals, where we've moved beyond the transition from Romanesque into Gothic. So we have to deal with the fire. Notre Dame Cathedral will catch fire April 15th of 2019. They're doing construction in the roof and around the central spire. The spire, of course, is 19th century. It's later. It's not actually, it doesn't actually date to the original construction of the cathedral. And this is an image that a lot of us saw. I remember that day we had class. I had I sent information out to all of my classes about this happening because no one knew it was going to happen at the time. We didn't know if the cathedral was going to come down. We'll get into that in a second. So here are the stages of the fire as it kind of progresses. So we start with the fire in the spire. It moves through the roof. The problem is that roof where you saw the peak. Obviously, you have the rib vault, the stone rib vaults underneath. That wooden roof on top is just to keep rain and weather off the stone. So it's made of wood. The roof itself is made of lead. And so that lead would drip off. The wood underneath it was known as the forest. There are over 700 timbers used to hold up that roof. And it is incredibly old. It's about 700 years old. As a result, it was dry and burned really well. And so you see the roof has basically from here, this roof section, as well as this section, pretty much the entire exterior wooden roof, is completely gone by the time the fire is extinguished on Tuesday morning. So from the exterior, here we have a before and after. And we see that scaffolding and everything that was actually very, very tricky for them to take down because they were afraid it was actually going to collapse onto the stone, the ex now exposed stone rib vaults and ceiling underneath it. So we see the roof has completely disappeared. There's actually an interesting note. Here is the front wall that's behind the bell towers for the nave. And so that is still standing. They were concerned that the fire was going to burn in here, weaken these stones, and take down these bell towers. It, of course, never happens. But these were concerns at the time. And I should point out that Notre Dame was in really bad shape when the fire started. They were going through a massive reconstruction, an emergency reconstruction project, to try and shore up much of the building. Now, as we look at it, here we're comparing a before and after of the interior. And you'll notice that there are holes in the roof through the stone vaulting. But you'll also notice that those holes, for the most part, leaving aside the crossing, this large piece here where the steeple and some of the scaffolding fell through, all the rest of the rib vaults held up. This is probably why it's standing. You'll notice this giant hole here follows the rib vault. So we lost one bay there. We lost one bay in the center, but it's not sufficient to actually take the entire building down. Had we lost the actual vaults here, 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 for example, just a few of them, we would have actually lost, it would have dominoed, and this would have collapsed, which would have taken down the next one and the next one, and we might have lost the entire building. So those rib vaults that I talk about as sort of this major development of the Gothic, are a huge development. That single Gothic invention is probably why Notre Dame continues to stand to this day. Now, as of 2022, give or take the time of this recording, they are repairing it. There's a temporary sort of tarp roof over it. It's scaffolded around. The biggest issue with Notre Dame right now is, A, how are they going to repair it? Are they going to do something new and 21st century for the roof, or are they going to go back to what it was? And number two, who pays for it? It's, of course, a Catholic cathedral, but we see people of all religions exploring it when they are tourists in Paris. So should the people of France pay for it? Should the Parisians pay for it? Should the church pay for it, the, the Catholic church? These ideas of who is going to pay for this project that's going to probably cost several billion dollars by the time it's done, the, the equivalent of, you know, firing a rocket to the moon. 
this project is going to take a lot of time and a lot of money, and it's going to take a lot of discussion about who owes what. Now, in the days and weeks following, they raised about a billion dollars for the repair, but that is nowhere near enough to do what needs to be done to shore up the cathedral and repair what needs to be done. And it's very possible that this will not be completed in your generation, which is sad given the importance of Notre Dame Cathedral.